there was this convertible full of girls and it was stopped at the red light and they were blaring smooth out of the car. <laughs> and that's how I found out that it was a single. That was me, Rob. That was me <laughs> at the corner were. of Spring and Green. That was me. I was like, fuck, it's Blossom. And then I, uh, <laughs> I thought that I had had an unreasonable understanding of, of what a successful song is. But this was another world. It was a, a worldwide immediate smash. And it was like, I mean, to this day, if I meet someone, especially from another country, and they're like, oh, I love that song, I know what song that they're talking about. When it came out, I was in love with it. Then, like, a bunch of other people, I got really, really sick of it and didn't want to hear it again. <laughs> and then, like, 20 years later, it started to creep back in, and I was just kind of like, all right, you know, I, I could live with you now. Now, I, you know, I think it's because right off the bat, there's an element of cheese to, man, it's a hot one. Like, it's just... <laughs> yeah. But I, mean, I love it. It's so cheesy, but but somehow it's the only line that would work. In some ways, it's like you're going to float away. It's hard to explain how you feel a million pounds and weightless at the exact same time. But you feel like a lead balloon that's about to float away. I feel my heart in like every part of my body. And it feels hard, not necessarily fast. It just feels... And I feel like I can feel it in my knees. I can feel it everywhere. And if I, if I fixate on it, it makes it worse. And it just keeps, it keeps coming and keeps coming and keeps coming. And, and it, would, it would get to a point where I could make it come on just because I would be, sometimes I would just be so excited that I was doing something and not having a panic attack. And that thought would make it start going, oh yeah? And then it would just kind of come creeping in. It's my and Bialik's breakdown. She's going to break it down for you. Because you know she knows a thing or two. And now she's going to break down. It's a breakdown. She's going to break it down. Hi, I'm Ryan Bialik. I'm Jonathan Cohen. Welcome to our breakdown. This is the place where we break things down so you don't have to. I'm already laughing because I'm feeling like I'm headed for a breakdown is a lyric from a song written by a person who's going to be talking to us in a minute. Voice of a generation to many. We're talking to Rob Thomas from Matchbox 20. We get some behind-the-scenes scoops about what motivated some of his uh, most influential songs, some of the most well-known work. I mean, there's first of all, I've never heard him on a podcast. I'm not saying we're the only ones, but this is not a format I've heard Rob Thomas exist in. And we're like in his home we are talking about growing up being like living on the street. We're talking about the like insanity that he experienced as a kid growing up in a home with a really, really troubled um, mom. He talks about how he got from stealing cars and being sentenced to jail at 17. To writing 3 a.m. and <laughs> a collaboration with Carlos Santana that almost crazy. every single person has We're heard. We're talking to Rob Thomas. <laughs> Amazing. We're so excited to welcome to The Breakdown, Rob Thomas. Break it down. First of all, you look 25. Like, why did I age <laughs> and you that did just, not? <laughs> maybe you just, you got to catch me in the right light. <laughs> I promise it's all there. It's all decaying at a, at a rapid rate. I mean, I don't mean to age you, but you know, you you've you've been making music for a minute, and you know, yeah, it's, not you like, just, it's not like I can hide it because I like I started thirty <laughs> years ago and I wasn't five. Right. So, <laughs> okay. Well, first of all, congratulations. You look amazing. I imagine oh my God, that I've been, you know, I've been on this podcast for like three minutes, and between you and Valerie, you've just made my whole day. <laughs> like I just feel I feel elated. Thank you guys so much. I'm done now. This is all I need. Bye. I feel validated. Well. Um, I've only asked one other person this who's come on our podcast, and it was Matthew McConaughey. Do you know who I am? Like, do you know why you're here? Oh, well, of course. It's, I mean, I've known you since I was a kid. I've known you since Blossom. What? I've, I'm a, I'm a, I was a big, I was literally just watching Big Bang Theory, uh, like right what? before I walked in the room. I was so excited with you in Jeopardy. Uh, That's so crazy. How is that crazy? You were, you were fucking Blossom. Like the, the whole world no, knew you. No, but that's. That's, it's very you strange. You even got a we, shout out on Seinfeld when they were at the NBC <laughs> studios. <laughs> so the reason that that's strange is that you're Rob Thomas. And so you exist <laughs> in another universe 
that is separate from sitcoms of the 90s and Seinfeld. But I, I'm not sure if you know, but you were in a much recent, more recent one even. <laughs> it did really well. It did really well. This is a thing about Mayim, though. She assumes that none of the people that come on the podcast either want to be here or actually know anything about why they got here or how they got here. That is hilarious. No, I'm, I'm actually very, very happy to be here and very happy to meet you. Thank you. Um, you. You don't do a lot of podcasts. You're not like a I do a ton of press kind of guy. Like you've obviously done some really substantial and fantastic interviews, um, but you you have kind of a, a, a private life, it seems. You know, I do. But also, it was just one of those things where I just recently was talking to my manager and he was like, so how do you feel about podcasts? And I was like, I fucking dig podcasts. I think they're great. And he's like, well, you never do them. And I was like, no, no, you never bring them to me. Like, I'm not sure <laughs> how else I would get them. Like, I'm not cold calling podcasts, you know. <laughs> hey, what are you What are you doing? Justin Long, what are you doing? What What we often, you know, talk to people about is sort of like where they're from and how they got here. Um, and you know, you 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 hail from quite a ways from from Westchester County um, and from from the part of of the world that you live in now. Yeah, geographically and otherwise. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Um, so you're from South Carolina, correct? Oh, yeah. Originally, I, I was born in Germany, but I came over to South Carolina when I was really, really young, like two years old. I lived at like Fort Jackson Army Base because my father was in the army. Um, and then my parents got divorced, like right when we got back to the States. I lived in South Carolina for a little while and I moved, I want to say like in like fourth grade, I moved to Florida. You don't have any memory of being born in Germany, correct? You were little. I don't at all. Only, you know, the photographs, these, you know, everything. So apparently everything in my life was sepia tone until I got to South Carolina. <laughs> got it. Um, and did your dad stay in the military? No, he got out as soon as his time was up. And the only thing he used to tell me over and over and over, the only good advice I got from him was never join the army. <laughs> He, he's not a fan. Was your dad part of your life once you moved about? Or you, I know you were raised partly with your mom and also your grandma was around, correct? Yeah, it was mostly my mom. Uh, my grandmother, like all, like I was like summer residencies at my grandmother's. My grandmother was this character and she owned a store. It was like a general store, like in this tobacco town called Lake City, South Carolina. Like it's an, on a, even on a good map, it's really tiny. And uh, it's, it, she owned like the store that all the tobacco farmers would come to, you know, it was like, it was the social hub of this tiny little town. And we also lived in the back of this store. Like you'd walk through the store and that's how you'd get to the house, the part that we lived in. And it was, I mean, it was modest to say the least. It was where the, like the floors, if there was a hole, it went straight to the ground kind of a thing, you know? And, uh, and there was, and all the cast of characters were there and she used to bootleg liquor out from this room under the stairs. And she used to sell weed, you know, like in little dime bags. So I was like, you know, 10 years old, learning how to like weigh out dime bags and take the seeds out and everything. Uh, you know, good life lessons that I was learning at a young age. <laughs> My dad lived near there in South Carolina. But because I think there was a I didn't realize until years and years later that my mom and him like my mother had a strange relationship with drinking and would kind of terrorize my father. And so I didn't get to see my father a lot. And I didn't understand why. So he wasn't really a, a presence. You know, he was definitely every, you know, once a month weekend dad kind of thing. And when you were 12, your mom was diagnosed with Hodgkin's. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine, especially if she was a single mom, like that must have kind of turned everything upside down. Um, you had an older sister, but she left home young, correct, to get married. Yeah, my sister was a, was a really fun story because, A, she's, I think, the only person in my family that I'm really close to and I'm, that I speak to all the time and that, you know, and uh, because I think we went through a lot together and that that kind of, you know, bonded us forever. But she left home. I was like my her last day of school, my last day of sixth grade. She ran away from home at 17 and moved in with her 21 year old boyfriend. She got married at 18 years old and uh, they have been married almost 40 years now. And they're like the closest couple I've ever met in my entire life. What? Yeah. You never hear those stories. Never. Yeah, no, no. You, everybody thinks it's going to take a weird left turn, but it doesn't. It just <laughs> continues on in bliss, you know, for their entire life. That's that's pretty young, though, also, for you to be sort of left, especially with your mom um, not being well. And then, yeah. as you've talked about, um, your mom went into remission, I guess, when you were about finishing high school. But... 
Um, it sounds like your mom was kind of a, a character, a kind of a partier, like you grew up in an unusual situation and especially without a sibling. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think a lot of this, if you don't mind me, you know, sort of psychoanalyzing your music, which I've spent a lot of my life doing, um, you know, there's a lot of experiences in 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 there that I think make their way in one way, you know, or another into a lot of your lyrics. So I'm curious if it felt like it started then, that kind of intensity. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, as far as the way that it, it creeps into to creativity, I think it's always one of those things where it's not necessarily that I write about these situations, but these situations informed me of the way the world works in a different way. And so I looked at other situations that I would go into in the future, I think through a different lens than maybe I would have had I had a normal upbringing, you know, in that way. So my mother, you got, you got to go back to when she was like, she got married at 16 and had my sister at 18, had me at 21. She had a, a crazy abusive alcohol. My grandmother was like someone who wouldn't drink for like two years. And then she would drink straight for like a month and a half and just binge out and like just leave, you know, a, just rubble in her path. And she would get very, very physically violent. And then my mom picked up that as well. But then she, so she went through all that. She wound up raising us. She moved us from literally these kind of slummy apartments by lying about her age and getting a job as a computer programmer when that was like a new job and wound up, you know, with us when I was a teenager living in the middle class in Florida in a middle class suburb. And she was the head of quality assurance for Citicorp, a national bank. You know, she was, she kind of this brilliant mind when it came to math. But after the cancer and after her first time going through the cancer, I just feel like, I mean, I didn't realize this until later, obviously, but I, I think she just started going through her childhood then in the way that she never felt like she got to from the minute, you know, that she was 16 years old. She never got to be that 16 year old or that 17 year old or do any of those things that you get to do. So I think she just kind of did it at mine and my sister's expense. And for a long period of time, like right up until my sister left, it was, it was my sister and I, and we, you know, we were, we could, we did this together. We would protect each other through all these situations. And then when she left, there was a sense of like total abandonment. But I think my sister and I realized how close we were even more after that, because then we didn't have that sibling kind of, you know, rivalry thing that was going on. We were just two people and she would check in on me to make sure I was okay. And I wasn't. And that's why I left home many, many times, you know, when I was young. Taking care of your health isn't always easy, but it should at least be simple. That's why for the last few years, I've been drinking AG1 every day, no exceptions. It's one scoop mixed in water once a day, every day, and makes me feel energized, focused, and nourished. And it empowers me to take on the day. That's because each serving of AG1 delivers a daily dose of vitamins, minerals, pre and probiotics, and more. It's a powerful, healthy habit that is also powerfully simple. I know with AG1, I'm giving my body high quality nutrition and getting essential brain, gut, and immune health support, every batch of AG1 goes through a rigorous testing process so you know it's safe, and their ingredients are sourced for absorption, potency, and nutrient density. I know I'm covering my nutritional bases right from the start of the day. I like to drink AG1 first thing in the morning, which is recommended for optimal nutrient absorption. You fill your shaker up, with cold water, add one scoop of AG1, you give it a little shake and you're ready to go. If I'm running short on time and can't mix my AG1 before heading out, I just grab a travel pack. Each is an individual serving of AG1 that's super easy to mix on the go, helping ensure that I get my daily nutrients no matter what. The thought of taking a million supplements or mixing and matching pills and powders is exhausting, but one daily scoop of AG1 covers my nutrient gaps and supports mental and physical health without a lot of hassle. In just 60 seconds every morning, I know I'm giving my body what it needs and setting up sustainable habits for the long run. If there's one product that we had to recommend to elevate your health, it would be AG1. That's why we've partnered with them for so long. Do you want to take ownership of your health? Of course you do. Start with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3 plus K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase exclusively at drinkag1.com slash breakdown. That's drinkag1.com slash breakdown. Check it out. Miami Alex Breakdown is supported by Helix Sleep. Well, my life's been better for about two years since I had my Helix delivered, and I can't believe how well I have been sleeping. Jonathan loves his. 
My kids love theirs. The Helix lineup offers 20 unique mattresses, including the award-winning Lux Collection, the newly released Helix Elite Collection, a mattress designed for big and tall sleepers, and one made just for kids. But if you're my kids, you like a grown-up mattress. Take the Helix Sleep Quiz and find your perfect mattress in under two minutes, and your personalized mattress will be shipped straight to your door free of charge in a box so tiny you can't believe a luxurious, fantastic mattress is in it. Helix also offers a 100-night trial and a 10 to 15-year warranty to try out your new Helix mattress. Everybody's unique. Everyone sleeps differently. Each of Helix's mattress models are designed for specific sleep positions and feel preferences. There's memory foam layer ones to provide optimal pressure relief if you sleep on your side, models with a more responsive foam to cradle your body for essential support in stomach and back sleeping positions, and Jonathan loves this, enhanced cooling features to keep you from overheating at night. Every Helix mattress combines individually wrapped steel coils in the base with premium foam layers on top. It's the perfect combination of comfort and support. It's even recommended by multiple leading chiropractors and doctors of sleep medicine as a go-to solution for improving your sleep. I took the quiz and I was matched with Midnight. I like something kind of firm. I mostly sleep on my side. Jonathan's more of a Twilight person, but our mattresses are absolutely an upgrade. Helix is offering 20% off all mattress orders and two free pillows. I also love the pillows. For our listeners, go to helixsleep.com slash breakdown. Use the code HELIXPARTNER20. This is their best offer yet, and it won't last long. With Helix, better sleep starts now. One of the things that I've that I've read that you've talked about is sort of like in the absence of social media, um, you know, the kind of sort of adolescence that... Um, that many kids who were troubled or trying to figure stuff out or turning to drugs and alcohol and music, you know, to try and sort of fill all those holes, like those things existed in this kind of vacuum of just like, this is the behavior that people do when they're trying to figure shit out, you know, when they, often when they come from that. It feels weird because like the social media in general, it feels like there's a tipping point. You know, it feels like there's this side over here where up until here, it, it was something that, that we could have used when I was young because I felt very much alone. I felt like I was the only person in the world that felt the way that I was feeling or going through the things I was going through. And maybe if I had had some sort of a connection like that with, with strangers, I would have had the, the idea that like, oh, this is, this is semi-normal in different circles. This is how other people live and this is how they cope with it. And this is a mechanism that I can use. And then from this point on, it kind of makes me feel like, oh, everybody else is doing great and I'm not doing great. And, and I want to kill myself now because this is happening, you know. So I, I'm not sure how I, if I would have been any better, any worse without it. Um, I know that when I was young and coming up in music, it was nice that it wasn't around. Um, just in the fact of like, I, I feel so much for young people now that get into music or get into acting and they're thrust into this space and then they, all their mistakes are there forever. Instead of like something that you would learn from, like most people would, they don't even get a chance maybe to do that sometimes. Uh, so I was glad I didn't have it then. Anyone who's read, um, you know, the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous um, knows that it was mainly written for dudes because at the time that it was written, it was written for dudes. And it would like, you know, tell you about, you know, how to deal with uh, there was a chapter for wives, you know, um, alcohol, uh, alcoholism was really seen as like this like male disease. And of course, the big book and you know, people talk about that, of course, women struggle with alcohol as well. Um, but it's interesting that you just identified, you know, two generations of of women. And it's not a story that you often hear, meaning a lot of times we hear about like the alcoholic dad and like it was so hard. And, um, and I'm curious, you know, especially in the absence of kind of like a dad being present. Um, I wonder if looking back, you know, now that you're older and you're a parent, do you do you think differently about sort of the 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 pressures, you know, both on you as a kid and also what it was like for your mom in her struggles to be that that woman who was struggling that way when that's not usually what you hear about? Yeah, I mean, I think about it all the time. Like my dynamic was, you know, talking, you know, through therapy and you realize that like so much of the way that I behave, I still struggle with drinking issues. I still struggle with trying to keep myself together. Uh and you know, it was being caught between this unbelievable force coming at you at a thousand miles an hour, which was my mother who would get very manic and get very violent. And we'd have to deal with that situation coming at you. And then this absence of my father in a way. And so like having this, all of this rage in both going in both directions, but to my father, it's more because he was absent because he was weak because it kind of felt like he should have chose me over the convenience of not having to deal with my mother. You know, and then I felt like my mother should have chose me instead of her own childhood. And then 
you know, before my mom passed away, I, I think that I had to learn to have more distance away from her because it got very, when things started to work out for me, it got much weirder with her. It became, she became very weirdly sycophanty, but not in like a mother father, son way. It was, it was like in this, I felt like the little kid from Star Wars that could make people do things with his mind and everybody was scared of him all the time. Like, it was always like, oh, yes, no, you're the best, you're the best. And then she would get drunk and go on radio stations and do interviews and she'd come to shows and rage and, you know, scream at people. And so I had to have that distance from her. But all that said, before she passed away, I had a much better understanding of her as a as a human being and not just a parental figure and not just what she wasn't to me. You know, and I kind of felt really, really bad for her. And I wish that she had had someone to talk to about it. The other thing, you know, you had this kind of unbelievable you know, an unbelievable childhood in many ways. You know, you talk about kind of how you lived and like what it was like and, um, you know, dealing with your mom's, you know, mental health challenges. You know, that's how, how I, how I see it, you know? Yeah. My wife gets so sad. Like if my, if my wife brings up any story, she'll be like, <laughs> you know, oh my God, this makes me think of that one Christmas where, you know, and, and it's this beautiful Hallmark memory. And then I'm like, oh, that's right. I go, you know, I remember the Christmas, like where, where my mom had this ex-convict living in our house and they, and like we were having Christmas, but then she started making out and they would like doing it under the Christmas tree and I had to leave the room. And she's just like, why do you, why do you fuck up all my memories? All of them. I was well, coming like, wah, I guess. Wah. <laughs> yeah, no, I I get it. So I guess that's sort of that that makes me curious about what your perception was, you know, as a teenager. Um, you know, m many people and I know it's more old fashioned to think of like, oh, you know, using alcohol and using drugs like that's a choice. That's a moral choice. Like most of us know that is not a, a, a choice for many people. Yeah. It is a it is a complicated mental health coping mechanism. Yeah, I mean, if it was a choice, then I wouldn't have conversations with myself on some days saying, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do this. And then later on in the night, find myself doing it and not understanding why, you know, right. it's, it, it, if it's a choice, it's happening from some inner voice inside of me that I'm not quite, haven't quite gotten in touch with yet. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about uh, you, you, you left home, you know, young, I mean, you were mm -hmm. still a kid, you were still a teenager. Um, and you know, I, I wonder when you think back, like who, who was that kid? Like what, you know, what what demons did you already feel you were trying to sort of calm? Um, and where did music kind of come into that? Like I, I was started, I was in a band when I was like 14. And that was like my first kind of bug, you know, but I had I was still at home. Uh, I was still, you know, had a, had it pretty it, it wasn't normal by any means, but I was still, you know, waking up and going to school. And I had I mean, my mom would be gone for days at a time sometimes and I would be left on my own. But I still had my mm. sister sometimes and it was, you know, be like the two of us. I, I, so my mom would have this this way of she would become whoever she was dating at the time. And so there was a lot of different guys coming in and out. And if there was a biker, then she would be off at bike week for a month because she was a biker now. And, you know, if, if he was a family man, then we were a family now. And this is how we were going to act. And so we just kind of were chameleon and, you know, to whatever, whatever she was going through. Uh, so I... When I would leave, like, let's say started at like 15 and I would hitchhike back and forth up to South Carolina to like where my grandmother's house was or down south in Florida to where I had some family. And uh, it was almost though, like this romanticized notion of like, you know, in my head, this is going to age me even more. Like in my head, I, I, I get picked up on the side of the road. I'm in the back of somebody's truck. I'm in the back. I think I'm in a Corey Hart video singing <laughs> Never Surrender, you know, and I'm just like. <laughs> I'm like, this is like, oh, this is kind of, I'm free. Like, this is a freedom here, you know? Um, there, It would get sad when, like, I just didn't have somewhere to be or when I didn't know where to sleep or I didn't know where to eat or those kind of things. And then it got even sadder when I couldn't go home. Like, the first time I ever went home and she was like, no, you, you know, you don't live here anymore. Uh, but that would be because I trashed our house when she was gone one time. You know, like, the the kind of the classic uh, teen movie party situation. Um. And so uh, then she just couldn't handle it. Uh, so I'm not really sure. I don't think until I really, I was in my, you know, maybe late 20s and really maybe after I met my wife that I really started to kind of examine cause and effect or reasons why I was doing the things that I did, you know, and I just kind of just chalked it up to just, I would write songs about it and be like, oh, I'm just fucked up. That's who I am. 
and and never really kind of delved into it until until my first therapist but my first therapist like on our fourth session fell asleep in the middle of our session and then said that I was boring her <laughs> no and so yeah and so that put me off therapy for like a while and now I finally found someone that you know that I really can relate to and that kind of feels like she understands I'm sorry me. I think we need to take a minute and think about this Th- th- she fell asleep? asleep? Just right across from me in the chair, just. <laughs> and I'm like, hey. <laughs> no. <laughs> hey. And she goes, <sighs> like, and then, and I was like, I she doubled down. I'm like, so I, you know, you, I thought she just kind of lost you there for a second. She goes, well, <laughs> you were boring me. No. <laughs> That's horrible. So that, for a minute there, I just, I was, that could have put me off of therapy altogether. That's horrible. Sorry. I want her license revoked. I'm not sure. I mean, there is some degree of therapy that exists at all times when you're writing because it, mm. it's a, there's an inward looking that happens. Um, only the thing about songwriting is that sometimes you're masking what you're writing about to make it more universally to, to, for other people to kind of understand the emotion that you're talking about. Maybe not the actual thing, but the emotion from that thing. And then in that way, you're asked, unless you're communicating better with yourself, you're masking it from yourself as well. So even for years and years and years, I could look back now at some of the songs on the first record and second record and be like, oh shit, now I, I know where that comes from now or I know where that comes from now. Did you always write? Like when did, you, when did your writing start? I was writing, but I kind of feel like it was all very superficial from the outside in. Like I was trying to write songs that I think would convey to other people so they would feel about me the way I wanted them to feel about me. So, and mostly that just means I was like writing bad Lionel Richie songs and trying to get laid in high school because I was a weird kid. And it was like, it was the only, uh, you know, like that was my only thing that I had because I lived in Florida. I didn't know anything about cars or, or racing or hunting or football. So like, if you're a weird kid like me, the only thing you got is you show up at a party with the Lionel Richie songbook tucked up under your arm so that, you know, when all the football players pass out, you can try and play for their girlfriends. And, you know, and that's, and that's, that's my move. That was the only move I had. When I was like 20, uh, I, 20, 20 or 21 in that range, I wrote 3 AM. And that was a song I wrote about my mother having cancer and about dealing with that. And that was the first time that I wrote a song that A, made me kind of understand that there was, could be a catharsis in that. And it was, it wasn't just something, you know, that I was doing to pick up girls. And then also it was, it was the first song that I wrote that I was like, oh, I, I think other people should hear this. I think this is a, a song that's good enough for other people to listen to. So you started like in your early teens, just as a way to get attention. And then yeah. it sounds like, which is still really like fascinating. Cause you know, while it may have been your only, you know, approach to women, like it's still it's still a hard approach. Like you have to, you know, like that, that's, you have to, you have to put a lot of work in. So like you're, you're clearly showing signs of being uniquely creative in that moment. I I also do. I think 30 years later, the, the doing things to get attention mechanism is still deep, deep in me. (laughs) I mean, I, I, my, my job for a living is going, Hey, look at me, listen to me. I'd like to know a little bit about, you know, sort of what happens between 17 and 3 a.m because those seem like the most potentially dangerous years when I kind of, you know, look back at sort of where you were, where you could have gone, right? How did we, how did we get from 17 to 3 a.m.? At 17, I was arrested for armed burglary. Now, what really was happening was I was with, a, you know, just a group of kids. We used to, we would steal cars or we would, you know, steal things from cars or we would... We would break into people's homes and rearrange their furniture. What? We wouldn't take anything. We would just break in. It was like a prank. <laughs> Maybe we would take some beer out of their fridge or something. And, and most of these were like people that we knew and either didn't like or were you were high? Really good friends. I want to know. Were you high? Oh, I didn't really start smoking weed until I was like nineteen or twenty. So no, I would. That feels I, more like know, a. I, that feels for me. That's like a drunk activity. You know, mm. we were. We were the. You know, that was weekend binging high school weekend binging you know time but uh this was just like wanting to find a place where you fit in and and i wanted these kids to like me and i and so i wanted to be the cool kid so i always wanted to take it one step farther i would and like one time there was a gun involved and and so it i got arrested and it was armed burglary because the gun was in the house and uh and then uh, i got arrested once for stealing a car both these times i got community service 
both these times, my community service was so easy that I didn't really learn anything from it at all. Um, all my friends at this point were starting to go in to, to get arrested. So I was like, all these things were heading in this direction. And then I started writing, you know, like really writing. And I wanted to start a band to kind of showcase this writing. And this, I think that was the kind of thing where this, I met another group of misfits that just weren't as dangerous to be around. You know, they still were very unconventional, which I liked. They still, you know, they didn't really fit in. They were still misfits in every sense of the word, but they weren't toxic. And they, you know, they weren't going to, you know, these, they took me in and they made me feel like I had a family. And that was, I think, everything about this life since then. Well, and some of the, you know, when I look at sort of some of your, your music influences, you know, obviously, um, you know, you, you come from the South, you come from a, a, a beautiful musical tradition of, of country, you know, and of blues and things like that. Um, but, you know, there's, in a Rolling Stone interview, you, you talked about, you know, moving into like Billy Joel and Elton John, right? Which are these really kind of like sensitive, poetic, lyrical people. And then, you know, I... I was introduced to Elvis Costello when I was 16 and it was like my head exploded because I did not know that a young man, right, could have this much like anger and brilliance and excitement and power musically. Um, and, you know, two other influences that you mentioned, which, you know, I'm a little bit younger than you, but you know, the cure and the femmes, like sure, that yeah. was, you know, that was late eighties. Like that was, a, a real kind of revolution in in the way that especially young people could access really deep emotion in music. And I think that's what resonates. It was crazy. And that was a girl. I mean, I was a radio head up until that point. And I was beholden to whatever was happening on radio. And so, you know, I, it, you know, it was, I think we were talking like right around hair metal time, you know, like, like pop hair metal time. And I was dating, I dated this, girl who just like gave me a full tutorial just would sit down and just start throwing cassettes at me now this this is the violent films and these are the cure and this is you know and this and just going through everything and it just blew my mind and i and i went from there took a left field for a little while into like some serious punk you know i was in like some minor threat and, and black flag and and uh and also because like i that group of misfits when i was like 17 that group of misfits really appealed to me, the alt kids. They were, you know, a lot of them were drama kids. And if they weren't drama kids, they were just the kids that were like across the street from the school smoking before school started. You know, they were, they had their, their misfits jacket, uh, safety pinned onto the back That's of their right. team. You know, like, I was like, these are, these are my people. And I really, and huh. I felt like that just completely was a, a 180 from everything that I kind of was used to, you know? Okay, so my next question, because like now I'm like I'm all excited about this musical, um, uh, like this musical phase of your life, because also you were straddling, you know, you're straddling these worlds. You were straddling this like world of what you were raised in and what you were trying to leave and what held some promise, you know, for essentially what turned into the rest of your life. One of the things that I think about when I think about, you know, like the first time I heard Matchbox 20, you know, it you really were able to straddle pop music, meaning music that was popular to a lot of people and had a really broad appeal while also still maintaining, it sounds like, a lot of the sort of heart and the grit that you felt you needed to communicate. Did it ever occur to you like, oh, I don't want to be famous for my music. I don't want to be a pop star or I want my music to appeal to this kind of person. Or were you just like, I'm going to make music and see what happens? Yeah, I mean, I, I never really thought about it. I mean, I learned early, early on that, that, I mean, I want, I wanted to write much cooler music than I wound up writing. <laughs> you know, like I wanted to be, I wanted to, I wanted to be Wilco, you know, like when AM came out, like I wanted to be Jeff Tweedy or I wanted to be Tom Petty. And like, it would always be like a little bit of this, but then it would always go back to there's, here comes, here comes the Elton John, here comes the Lionel Richie, here comes, you know. And so I embraced that this was just who I am. And it became more of like, I sit down, I write something, I write a few songs, and then I look back at them and say, well, I guess this is who I am right now. And then that is my musical identity. 
Um, and it became felt more true and it felt more real. And it didn't feel like I had to kind of like think too hard about crafting stuff. I would just keep writing until things struck me as true. Um, but that said, I, I always also kind of knew that there was a connection between if I did well, that, that means more people were listening to my music. And of course I wanted people to listen to my music. So I never had a fear of fame. You know, I was, I think I was more like bring it on. And also you got to remember in 30 years ago, the idea of that was much different than it is today. Uh, the, just the mechanics of what that means for to people know who you are is, is so different today. And so, you know, back then there was, it was still this great romanticized version in music that existed probably since 1950s. You know, I'm going to go start a band and a guy from a label is going to come see me and then he's going <laughs> to like my song and I'm going to make a record and it's going to get played on the radio and then people are going to come see me live and I'm a fucking rock star. And like, that was it. One, two, three, four. Uh, and, and, you know, it was like the last time I think where you could kind of do things traditionally like that. Right. I mean, you know, I like to remind my children who are 15 and 18, like there was a time, I mean, video did kill the radio star. There was a time when musicians were not attractive and no one cared. Yeah. Like I didn't, I didn't know what anybody looked like because I was just listening to like, oh, Sherry, our love will hold on. I was like, yes, it will. I didn't know in the late seventies or early eighties what anyone looked like, you know, yeah, Boston. Nobody saw right. Boston. I, I wouldn't know Boston if they walked up to me on the street today. <laughs> Mind Be Alex Breakdown is supported by BetterHelp. New year, new you. Am I right? You are 100% right. Well, not necessarily. While there are definitely some things about life I'd like to improve in 2024, you know what? There's some things about myself that I want to preserve. And around New Year's, we often get really fixated with how to change ourselves instead of expanding on all the things we're doing right. And I know you think about all the things I do right all the time. Every day I have a list. Maybe you finally organized one part of your space. Maybe you want to tackle another. Maybe you're taking your supplements every morning and now you want to actually eat breakfast too. Therapy can help you find your strength so that you can ditch the extreme resolutions and make changes that really stick, that highlight where you're at now. A lot of people think, oh, therapy's going to be so, so depressing. I'm just going to talk about all the things that are bad about me and bad about my life. That's actually not the only thing you do in therapy. There's so many other things to do in therapy. You can talk about all the good things about you that you want to expand on to other parts of your life. It's one of the things that we use therapy for. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. You fill out a brief questionnaire. You'll get matched with a licensed therapist. You can switch at any time for no additional charge. Celebrate the progress that you've already made. Visit betterhelp.com slash break today and get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash break. It's, you know, it's funny, my son, so my son, uh, just he turned 25 this year. He is a musician. He graduated from Berklee College of Music and just moved out to L.A. I just did a corporate show last weekend. He, he is now the guitar player in my solo band. What? Wow. Yeah, my guitar player, I've had the same guitar player in my solo band since 2004. And he kind of retired from playing live over COVID. And my son took over and he's got the gig now. So he's my right-hand man on stage. What is that like? That's amazing. And you know what the <laughs> best part is? When I, when I mentioned it to him about doing it, the first, he wasn't sure at first. He didn't want it to take away from his band and his focus and what he's doing. But uh, the deciding factor for him was, and he said, and this made me want to cry. He was like, you know, the best part is I'll get to spend more time with you than ever. Oh, yeah. And I was just like, oh, come on. Here, take the rest of my money. <laughs> I mean, what an amazing way to be able to connect, too, is, you know. Yeah, it's through that language. I mean, we've been able to do it whenever he's, you know, he's around and we play music and we write music and we do stuff together. But uh, doing it in that full, like, long form, two hours, playing back and forth, it was, it was a really great experience. Uh, I, I'm really looking forward to now getting back on the road for real. This is just a technical question that I don't know the answer to. Do you write everything? Like, I know who you are in Matchbox 20, and I know the names of your bandmates, and I know that they are incredible musicians. But, like, most people think of, like, Rob Thomas and also, like, you've obviously done solo stuff. It, are are you the main writer? Like, you just write? Uh, I, 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 I mostly was. I mean, for the first couple of records, it was only me. And then the next couple records, it would, it was, or the next record, it was like a couple songs by Paul and then the rest was me. And then I made a solo record 
And I think when I got back, the guys had gotten a lot better as writers. I wasn't as precious about the real estate on a record because I had an outlet now in my solo career to be able to do things. And so we did a, a, like a greatest hits record that had six new songs attached to it. There was a song called How Far We've Come was the single from that. And that we wrote all six of those together. And now you've, this last record we just put out, there's like five songs on there that Paul wrote by himself that I'm singing. And that's, that's like never happened before, but they were just really good songs and I wanted them on the record. I, I want to talk about um, Unwell uh, because, you know, I think I read I read a quote where you said something like, at that time, you thought that taking care of your mental health was writing a song about yeah. mental health. Um, can, can you talk a bit about also, like, is it scary to put a lot of yourself in lyrics that way? Do you feel it opens you up for something or do you see it as an opportunity, you know, to help others? Like, how does that work with that kind of song? I mean, I don't know even if the words mental and health were bandied together and thrown around as much as they were when that when I first wrote that song. I'm not sure that it was as as on the forefront and I'm not sure it was being talked about. And so I don't know that that, that in itself was at the forefront of my mind. You know, I just knew that I got a lot of anxiety. I was like smack dab in the middle. I think this was my our third record. I was right in the middle of a of a career where that was kind of an impediment, <laughs> you know, like for, for what I did for a living, you know, not being comfortable around other people was, you know, could have been a problem, which would lead to more drinking, more drugs, more all of those things to try and kind of like level out myself where I could have that social lubricant to feel okay to be around people again and be that version of myself. And then I became that version so much that I thought that's the one they people want to see. And then I would be letting people down if I wasn't that fun guy version of myself. Um, and so Unwell, I think was, Again, I don't believe that I was consciously saying, I'm going to write a song about this. I just feel like when I was done, I realized the itch that it scratched. And I was like, ah, oh, okay, you know, that, that was it. And then it was years and years later where people started to realize that it was okay to, to say I'm not okay. It was okay to not be okay. And it was okay. And it wasn't just, it was something that, you know, you see all of a sudden, like, I remember the, when it really hit me the first time, there was a, he was a, a, an NFL player who had been going through, uh, going through rehab and going through depression and was talking about that song, Unwell, being, you know, this song that, that helped him through it. And I, that was like one of the first times I even thought about someone that has that much outer strength having that kind of a problem, you know what I mean? Or that one who has, like, who has, who has a career together, who has all of these things that seemingly go in for them you know, and then you're realizing, oh, I'm one of those people going, well, what, what, what's wrong with you? You have it great, you know. When did the title come into the writing process? Was it, you know, afterwards? Was it as the starting point? It was, I think it was the first thing I wrote. And it was actually a little faster when I wrote it. It was, and uh, I think I had that melody going and then the, that line came out and it was Paul from Matchbox who was like, dude, you're crazy. You got to slow that down. That's a ballad. That's not a, you know, <laughs> he's like, it sounds like fucking Nelly right now. You need to, you need to tone it down. <laughs> and I was glad he said that. Um, I'm curious about, um, can you talk a little bit about your relationship with, um, with alcohol or, you know, whatever kind of category of alcoholism you like to talk about or, you know, meaning the, the larger, um, you know, the God shaped hole as, as we would say, um, you know, I think alcohol as a social lubricant is something that a lot of people can relate to. Yeah. You know, I, I always say, like, I, I'm a hell of a lot more fun with, you know, a glass and a half of something in me. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's that notion of if you want to find out why you're doing something, stop doing it. And um, that really is like, you know, I um, w once you stop, once you stop allowing yourself to be helped right? What right. a lot of us are left with was like, I think I'm an asshole. Like, I think I'm just depressed and grumpy and nobody wants to be around me like this. So why wouldn't I partake? What, what part of that speaks to you? That's just my experience. I don't know. Every, every piece of it. Like I was going through before therapy, you know, I was going through my, my wife has, has had a lot of health issues that we've, that we've dealt with for, but you know, almost the last 20 years, she had brain surgery. It's been, you know, lots of doctors, lots of, you know, long trips to doctors for long times. And it's something that her and I have been dealing with. 
And when I would go, I would go through these Jags where I, where I, I had no limiter whatsoever. And that was, that's kind of the thing. It's, I, I like to, I get to that lubrication point, but then I don't know when it stops. And I, and I just keep going and keep going. And then I'm, I'm that guy. And then I'm that guy that, you know, like tonight we're going out with a, with a great group of friends that we haven't seen in a long time. And my wife very, very sweetly will say, so baby, can you hold it together? Are you going to be okay? And I'm like, I promise you, you know, I'm going to be okay. <laughs> um, I, uh, I, I feel that, I mean, that, that relationship with it all the time. And like you had said, when we were the, before therapy and when we were in the deepest of, of you know, of when Marty's going through something, my thought was, all of this heartache is still going to be waiting for me if I'm sober. All of this stuff is nothing is going to change. If, if I change, I will make this change. The only thing that will be different is I'll be miserable all the time instead of just between the hours of when I wake up and six o'clock at night, you know, and starting at six o'clock is when feel good Rob can come into the picture. Um, but then after therapy, I realized that even though I still, I still drink way too much getting a handle on it, not becoming that guy, being able to, to stop at some point in the evening and, and can continue on with the rest of the evening. It did make my life better. It did make our relationship better. It did help in so many ways. And it wasn't futile. You know what I mean? And it wasn't just like me doing something performatively just so that my wife can see it and I can make her feel better. This was something that when she saw that effort, I saw in more effort and we, and it kept building on that. Uh, and so that's the more when I'm trying to, a world that I'm trying to live in now. Do you do individual therapy, couples therapy, both? I'm curious what Rob Thomas's therapy experience is like. <laughs> it's just right now, it's still just Zoom. Yeah. Uh, solo once a week. It was, okay, so she is a therapist, but she was also a couples therapist. And I, the first few sessions, she had so much good insight to our relationship that I almost wanted to turn it into a situation that she was our therapist. But then I, speaking to her, I had to realize once that at some point I was going to cross a line and speak some, some truths that are, that, that are come from me that I tell her that are only meant for her to hear. And at some point that would sully any relationship that she would have with my wife, you know? And so there was a, there was just one point where she knew too much and we had gone too far and she could only be mine. Uh, and my wife and I are still having the conversation about trying to find maybe for us. And, and what, you know, what's weird is that it's not when you're at the worst. It's not when you're at each other's throats. I mean, we've been together for 25 years. We've had, it, it, it's, I know it's an old adage, but we've had fights that last longer than a lot of our friends' relationships were. And, and you, can, you can just, you, can, you know how to just table that stuff. Like, you know how like you could be in a really good fight and then pause the fight because something's on TV. Like, no, look, that's a commercial I was telling you about. Um, but I find that it's not when we're in the deepest of the, of the holes. It's not when we're at each other's throats. It's not when things are the worst. It's when things started to really turn around and the, when we start to get along better and better that we're like, hey, maybe we should talk to somebody. You know, maybe, maybe this experience could be even better if we kind of learn how to communicate better, if we had, you know, better love language, if we had just better ways that we speak to each other. What what's your love language, Rob? <laughs> um, well, it used to be it used to be way more toxic than it is now. I mean, I used to, <laughs> it's kind of because like if you hear a song like Push, you know, a song like Push is written from a young, angry guy who's only been in manipulative relationships his entire life and believes that that's what love is. That is the that is the model for love, and that's because that was every model that my mom had shown me in any relationship she had been in. That's every relationship that I had seen with any member of my family was, you know, there was some sort of manipulation involved. When I met my wife, we were on the road and her mother, who is, since my mother's passed away, she's my mom. And I remember the first time her mom called me and we were on the road and I hung up the phone and I looked at Maudie and I'm just like, what's her deal? You know, like, what's, what's her angle? And she's, and she's like, well, what did she say? I was like, she wanted to know how I was doing. <laughs> the nerve. Like, what, yeah, what the fuck is that? And so <laughs> I... Uh, I honestly was so uncomfortable and I and untrusting with someone with because once things had started to do well for me, a lot of my relationships, without even me realizing it, were transactional. There was either the people that are surrounding me were on a payroll, 
or there was something that I could do for them or they could, you know, or they could do for me. And so, you know, the entrance more and more into my life of these kind of friends who wanted nothing from me and I wanted nothing from other than, you know, the feeling that I get when we're around and the, and the, and the information that we can share about life, uh, that, that was a huge shift in me as just as, you know, the way that I thought the rest of the world worked. I, it's a, a good time to talk more about um, push because it's had a little bit of a renaissance, as it were, um, with Barbie. On my end, I just got an email like you do from your publisher saying Greta Gerwig is making a movie, which had me right there. I love Greta Gerwig since, you know, back when she was just an actress, before she was a filmmaker. I've loved all of her films. Then Margot Robbie, then Ryan Gosling. And, and then, so my first thought was knowing her, knowing this song, knowing this situation, knowing that it's Ken's favorite song. <laughs> I was like, okay, now... I'm going to say yes to this a thousand percent just because I want to see Ryan Gosling's <laughs> beautiful face sing my song. But I knew that in some way I was going to be taken the piss out of. But in all honesty, I thought it was going to be much worse and in a much different direction than it actually turned out to be. Uh, like when I think about young, angry me who, who felt like I was being taken for granted, you know, in that way. And you don't have any other way to deal with it because you don't know emotion words, you know, and you're just like, ah, then you go out and you write a, a you know, a rock song that goes, her, 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 you know, and, uh, cause it's the nineties and that's how we all sounded. And, uh, and so like seeing it in that context, I, 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 I had, I just laughed very, very hard. And I thought it was, I thought it was really well placed. With this song sort of having, um, you know, a, a next generation, another generation, you know, of people who might not have heard it the first time around. Um, when I think about, you know, your career, like the longevity of your career, the fact that you're still touring, the fact that you still kind of get up on a stage. Do you, I'm going to ask this in the nicest way possible. Is there part of you that ever feels like, like, I'm tired, I'm old, my body is not what it once was to live this kind of rock star life? What does it feel like? No, I mean, you know, one of it is my, all my heroes and, and being people that have become my mentors and friends over the years, people like Carlos and people like Willie, Mick, they've been doing this for, for, for a very long time at a very high level. Um, I'm in better shape now than I was in my 20s, really. You know, like when I met my wife, I was 30 pounds heavier you know, than I am now. Um, I really didn't take care of myself. There was a lot of cocaine flowing through a lot of places. And uh, so I feel like maybe that was why, like my body, my body's like, oh, this is what it feels like to feel okay. Um, I, I do think that my relationship changes, you know, like if you listen back to the first Matchbox 20 record, you have songs like, uh, like Push and 3AM and the Real World, but there's also a lot of these kind of like, overly angsty kind of moments. You know, these songs like busted that are just like, ha, ha, ta, ta. and nobody's really that angry, right? And, <laughs> and now like, as we get older, we can't, we can't really play those songs and we can't listen to them with a straight face because it just sounds like <laughs> manufactured angst to some degree. And, and, we, and we take out the other parts that, that really still feel sweet to us and they still feel like home to us. Uh, but I mean, there's a lot of songs that we can't even listen to just because I do feel too old to have that kind of point of view. Like I feel too old to dress up, like to worry about if I look rock star. You know what I mean? Like those kind of things. Like I don't, I don't need to dress up like Lenny Kravitz with a bamboo vest every time I walk out of my house or, you know, my Ed Hardy tees or whatever. You know, like, <laughs> because there's a, I, say, I say Ed Hardy because there's a lot of dudes, you know, in my neighborhood and especially like a lot of guys who are like players from bands like from the 90s and they're still kind of holding on to this aesthetic of like, <laughs> You know, and you, like you can just tell the guy, you know, the guy. Yeah. Um, I think I'm too old for all of that. Unfortunately, like in my 40s, I started to be more animated than I ever have been jumping off the pianos and climbing things. And, and that's not going to last long because my my because <laughs> this knee is saying no, no more. Yeah. <laughs> but, at 50, but at 51, I mean, I, I, I'm just I'm glad that I've learned every one of these songs in a much slower, more intimate acoustic style, because one day they'll all wind up there. And in terms of also what it's like to sort of be with a band for this long, I think there's some quote that like you're all in therapy, you know, it's like a different phase of uh, being rock stars. Um, how have those relationships kind of shifted um, 
you know, that that's a long time to be in creative collaboration with people. What is that like? Well, I mean, we have a lot of breaks because I, when I start, you know, the solo records take me away for a year and a half, two years, three years. And by the time we get back together, we're genuinely excited to see each other. Now, I mean, when that first started happening, there was a lot of resentment to me wanting to do something solo. There was a lot of resentment from the idea that if I was working, they couldn't work. And they would feel like the band, even like now, the band builds some momentum, but then I go away and I do solo stuff, and then I build some momentum, and it just kind of keeps never, they feel like never really going to that potential. But as we got older, they're no longer resentful about it, or, or at least, like Paul said it the best, he's like, it bums me out when you're out touring for the summer and I can't tour. But you are one of my best friends in the world and I couldn't ask you to do something that I know makes you, or to not do something that I know makes you so happy and, and really makes you feel fulfilled. So I couldn't be the person to ask you not to do that. That is kind of a major difference in our relationship now. When it used to, like it, we would just be at each other's throats over something and we would, you know, but now it's very, very like, listen, when you said that, it made me feel like you don't hear me. <laughs> like there's a whole lot of that going on in our relationships now. Um, I wonder if you can speak a little bit to your, um, you know, uh, chart-topping, award-winning, record-breaking collaboration with Carlos Santana. Um, you know, I I wonder if you can talk a little bit about how that collaboration came about I saw Carlos Santana open for Bob Dylan um, many, many years ago. Um, but um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm curious how that came about. I'll, I'll be honest, just as a musical person, like I wouldn't have thought to put the two of you together. And then that became the song that I heard the most in my life that year. Yes. Sorry about that. <laughs> it's okay. I do. Have, I mean, I know the whole song verbatim, exactly how you sing it. But can you talk a little bit about how that collaboration came about and sort of what that did for your life and your career? It was such a different angle, you know, to add to all of your other achievements. Well, I mean, you know, we had just come off of that first record, which it was a three-year process of play into nobody in clubs. And then like the next year we're playing like big theaters and then the next year, it's we're playing arenas all over the world. And that all happened on this one record. And at the end of it all, I think the record had sold like 15 million records. It was, it was, it was kind of insane. And so I, it literally felt like we, I get on a bus, and I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't even have a home when I got on the bus. You know? And then three years later, I get off the bus. I'm in this serious relationship. I'm now in New York City. I'm getting this apartment in Soho. And then I'm there kind of like, I don't know who I am now because it's me, but it's, it's this different version of me, but this other version of me has only existed out on the road in the middle of it. I've never known who this version of me was like going out to dinner or living in, you know, like a neighborhood or going to a party. Like, I'm not sure what that is. And then there was a guy that lived right around the corner from me in Soho. I got a call that he was working on this record for Carlos Santana and he had started this track and they didn't like, like the melody and the lyric and wanted to know if I could rewrite a melody and lyric. And so I wrote most of it and then went back and him, him and I, this guy named me Tall Sure, we hammered it out. And then I thought for the longest time, like that was my, that was the end of it for me in that song. I was just going to write, I was really excited at the time about writing songs for other people that I wasn't going to sing. That was like a huge point of something that I wanted to do is be a writer. Um, and it, like a couple of weeks later, I, I was actually, I was trying for George Michael because George, me and George have the same manager. And I was like, I just thought he would sing and I thought he'd kind of be great at it. He told me years later that, that no, he wouldn't have done it. So I was like, okay, good. <laughs> um, and then Clive called and then I guess Carlos, I sang the demo. So Carlos, he's like, well, what about, literally he's like, what about the guy on the demo? Like, does he sing? <laughs> and they're like, yeah, no, he's, he's got a band. He, he's doing pretty good. And Carlos is like, well, I, I believe him. Let's just have him do it. Wow. I, that's where I wound up doing it. Maybe your demo is going to get picked well, up. Well, I was just going to say, like, tr give it your best on your demo is the take-home message from Rob Thomas on that. I didn't even know that it was the single because I had heard, like, you got to remember, what I knew about that record was that it had Wyclef, who was giant at the time. It had Eric Clapton, who wasn't racist yet. It had, uh, <laughs> like, uh, it had like, uh, like, all these huge, huge stars on it. And so even when people would write about it, they wouldn't write about Smooth or Me. And I remember Paul once going, dude, what do you expect? Everybody's really, really famous and you're not. Like, that's just the way, it, you know. And then 
I was walking down the street in Soho, coming out of my apartment, like right on like spring and green. And there was this convertible full of girls and it was stopped at the red light and they were blaring smooth out of the car. <laughs> and that's how I found out that it was a single. That was me, Rob. That then, was me <laughs> at the corner were. of spring and green. That was me. I was like, fuck, it's Blossom. And then I, uh, <laughs> so, so then I, uh, I, you know, they, it, Literally from that point on, though, like, I thought that I had had an unreasonable understanding of, of what a successful song is. But this was another world. I mean, Carlos was this legend. Supernatural was the album that year that was like the thriller of that year. It was a, a worldwide immediate smash. And it was like, I mean, to this day, if I meet someone, especially from another country, and they're like, oh, I love that song... I know what song that they're talking about. You know, I've had like 20 singles, but I know what, what they're talking about. It's unbelievable. That's such a great story. And I have a weird relationship with that song in that like, when it came out, I was in love with it. Then like a bunch of other people, I got really, really sick of it and didn't want to hear it again. <laughs> and then like 20 years later, it started to creep back in. And I was just kind of like, all right, you know, I, I could live with you now. Now, I, you know, I think it's because right off the bat, there's an element of cheese to Man, it's a hot one. Like, it's just... <laughs> yeah, but I, mean, I love it. It's so cheesy, but but somehow it's the only line that would work. <laughs> that's so awesome. Do you have that relationship with other songs of yours? Like the, you know, falling in love with them, maybe falling out of love with them? I, like, there's a... a the majority of songs, after like a five-year period, I'm fine if I never hear them again. But... But but I'm but not to say like I love to play them, like I still enjoy that relationship that I have with an audience when when it when we're when we're there and like like re-examining them and kind of like reworking them and those kind of things. Uh, it's just maybe it's more because when I hear them, I hear recording limitations. I hear things that I would have done different, or maybe you know things that I would have changed. Because every time you make a record, every time you do anything, you're doing your best version of you at that time. And then hopefully if you're growing and changing and evolving, you can look back on that years later and, and you're seeing it from this newly acquired point of view that you have from, from working at it so hard that you got better and better at it, that you look back and you're like, oh man, I would have done that differently or I hate the way my voice sounds or, you know, that kind of thing. Um, how does that apply to a relationship you've been in, you know, for uh, over two decades? Because what you described is I think what a lot of people who have been in a, you know, a, any long-term relationship would say, like, I did the best I could, and you keep, you know, kind of getting better and getting more perspective. Um, you know, I know that there are some people in the music industry who've been in relationships for a long time, but not a ton. I was really, um, I was really impressed. I mean, I'm sure it's a lot of work for both of you. Um, but yeah, I, I wonder kind of how fatherhood, uh, you know, changed your relationship and um, what that's sort of been like. So the dynamic, though, that was a little different was, when I met my wife, we started dating. I had to, we fell in love immediately. We knew that there was something here, but I had to tell her that I had a son who was about to be born. And that almost sent her, that was, I actually wrote the song, If You're Gone, the night that my son was born, because, because my wife now had basically told me that she didn't think that, that she could do this. Like she saw a life that in front of her and that didn't involve somebody who had already had a son. That didn't involve somebody who had already had this baggage with him. And that, it, you know, that was baggage that she wanted to acquire with the person that she was going to marry or be with. Um, and so I wrote, if you're gone that night in Denver, when my son was born for my wife to try and, and, you know, and just explain to her that I really, really wanted to try at this. Um, so we started off at that weird dynamic. We, started immediately traveling the world together. So, and I was, I always like to think that I was, I was more famous than she thought that I was, but less famous than I thought that I was, <laughs> you know? Like when I met her, Push was, was just becoming a really big single. And so I was like, I've got a fucking song on the radio. I got a song on MTV back when that was a big deal. And my wife was like, you're just a dude with a song on the radio. You're just a dude with a video. Like, it's not that big of a deal. You know, she's like, I'm a, she's a model. She's lived all over the world. I was like a small fish to her. And that bummed me out. <laughs> but, the, but it was good because, so we got to experience so much of it together. Like, I got to do a lot of it alone and kind of get, get things out of your system and kind of just 
see like see what this looks what happens when you do this and what happens here and what does that button do and then uh i wound up you know with her and we got to do all of these things together so we kind of feel like we were kids looking back now i mean we were you know in our mid, mid to late 20s but now when i see people in their mid to late 20s those are kids to me and so i kind of realize now how young we really were and how much we were forming and and now we're kind of still doing it like we got to see our 30s together we got to see our 40s together and go through all of those things um and and i've gotten you know to be closer to my son than i think i probably ever would have been had i stayed in a toxic relationship with his mother who i now of course have a better relationship than i would have as well you you've talked a bit about um about what panic attacks feel like um and i think it was um around the time that your mom passed which um you know, it sounds like you had a very complicated, you know, relationship with her. And and even when people don't have a complicated relationship, that kind of loss, you know, can bring up a lot. Um, we get a lot of questions um, here on this podcast about anxiety and about panic attacks. Um, I wonder if if you might be willing to share a little bit about what it kind of felt like for you and what are some of the things that you've done to learn to manage that? I mean, this feeling of like, in, in some ways, it's like you're going to float away. It's hard to explain how you feel a million pounds and weightless at the exact same time. And you feel like, but you feel like a lead balloon that's about to float away. And I feel my heart in like every part of my body. And it feels hard, not necessarily fast. It just feels whoom, boom, whoom, boom, whoom, boom. And I feel like I can feel it in my knees. I can feel it everywhere. And if I, if I fixate on it, it makes it worse and it just keeps, it keeps coming and keeps coming and keeps coming. And, and it would, it would get to a point where I could make it come on just because I would be, sometimes I would just be so excited that I was doing something and not having a panic attack. And that thought would make it start going, Oh yeah. And then it would just kind of come creeping in. And also it would get into places where, you know, you talk about being anxious, you talk about having anxiety, like at the lowest, you know, like the lowest level of that, like, I'm going to a movie. I sit down in the theater, the movie's about to start. That sense of anticipation would start to all of a sudden make me feel like I was gonna have a panic attack. And I would just sit there through the entire movie with my hands sweating. I can't really eat anything, but I don't want anybody to know about it, so. And then years later, when I started to talk about it more, it became just something where the guys would know. You know, if, if, we're, if we're rehearsing and I'm laying on the floor on my back singing like this, they're just stepping <laughs> over me. Because <laughs> they know that I'm okay. They know I'm going to be fine. They just know I need to kind of work it out. I'm doing some breathing and I'm just kind of getting myself where I need to be. Because it used to be Xanax that was a big, you know, helper for me. I didn't love the way it made me feel. And then because I had this bad relationship with drinking, I would just roofie myself all the time because you have, it's not a great combination. And so then I would over drink. And then the next day, your body feels so depleted. You're so dehydrated from all of that. Then you're more, you're, you're closer to one of those then um so like just trying to kind of find out what the triggers were when there was no trigger find out what the, what the trigger still was like what was really going on there you know uh and and it still is to some degree i haven't had a full on panic attack in quite some time but i felt panicky like i feel it like feel my palms start to get sweaty i start to feel a little bit of you know, my heart beating, but I've kind of gotten to this place where my inner dialogue can scream. Like I have this, this scream inside of me that shuts it down. That has a, that's like, no, that's not what's happening. That's not where you are. There's no purpose. This is, you know, there's no fight or flight right now. You're not fighting. You're not flying. You're, you know, you're fucking, you're, you're watching new girl. You're going to be fine. <laughs> Do you have any other things that you do? Um, do you exercise? Like, are you a meditation person? Like, I'm curious what what other parts of your, you know, especially like you said, you're like in better shape than you were, you know, in your 20s. Like, what else do you do that sort of keeps your mind and your body feeling healthy? I think exercise has really helped a lot. In like full disclosure, like everything I started doing for exercise was purely for aesthetics. I, I, <laughs> I, health was not in mind at all. But it was just because, you know, I didn't, I just didn't want to go back to being a little fat kid again. And so I, I would just work out. It had unintended other side effects, you know, where it, where it just had made me feel a lot better. And, and now I'm way more in touch with those 
with that aspect of it. And I really enjoy it. And I feel so much better when I'm just kind of get a second where it's me and my heart rate. And that's a part of it too. Like my wife always would laugh at me before because I would hold my, hold this like I was having a heart attack or something. And she's, but she would also notice that I'm not, I don't have a watch. I'm not counting anything, right? Like I'm just, I'm holding it. But I have this way of trying to sync up my breathing with the heart rate. And so when I get a hold of where my heart rate's at and I set my breathing with it and I put those in some sort of a harmony, it brings me right back to where I need to be. And so she's gotten used to that now and she'd be like, you're not dying. You're okay. You're not dying. <laughs> Um, it's really been such a pleasure, um, to talk to you. Can we, can we plug anything? I know you do amazing charity work. What can we tell people about, uh, where to check you out? Well, uh, please go and check out sidewalkangelsfoundation.org. Uh, it's the, it's the foundation when Madi and I started about 20 years ago. Uh, we work with no kill animal shelters and animal rescues around the entire world. And, uh, it's been 20 years now. We've raised millions to try and get everything from medical runs and medical facilities and places to help uh, facilitate like really big rescues from all over. Um, and, and just, and build facilities, maybe just from the ground up for anybody who has their LLC and, and that, you know, we get our attentions on. Uh, I, I'm back once again with the, the Matchbox 20 band and uh, we're going out to Australia in February. Uh, we have a new record out uh, where the light goes. You can find it. I guess, I mean, honestly, it's so funny. You, you, I guess you can just type it in somewhere and they'll tell you where to find it anywhere. <laughs> um, thank you so much. It's been really a pleasure to have you here. Thanks. You guys are pleasant. It's a very nice conversation. Man, it's a hot one. <laughs> it's just, I was singing all the songs while he was talking to us. It's very hard not to. I mean, you are a basically running jukebox in your head <laughs> at all times. Like, I I don't know that he understands that I literally, I sing literally in his voice. Like, I every intonation, every inflection. Can you do the first uh, stanza of Push? <laughs> no. Yeah. No, Come I'm on. not going to do it. Everyone wants you to. <laughs> no. I don't want to, it's going to snow. People are live tweeting Say, me. I don't know if I've ever been good enough. I'm a little bit rusty and... I think my head is caving in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you that people are live tweeting even though that this mostly is a pre-recorded episode. Mostly I harmonize with him because he says there's beautiful harmonies. Like it's really, so I'm usually, I usually sing backup for Rob Thomas. Look, yeah. We didn't even ask him if he needed a backup singer for his I think solo he's good. band. I think it could he's be good. you, his son, and him. I think he looks, he's fine. He's, he hasn't like heard he's you good. sing before though. I don't think Look, he needs to be singing with him. If he wants to do a Hanukkah album. <laughs> My favorite thing was when he said that he always wanted to write cooler songs than he did. <laughs> that was awesome. That was amazing. Um, no, that was really, he's really, he's very lovely. He's, some people call him like the nicest man in rock. I mean, he's very, very sweet and um, just gave us a lot of his time. Very, very appreciative that we got to talk to him. Is that, special. Are, are we the Rob Thomas of podcasting? I want to push you down. <laughs> We are not the Rob Thomas of podcasting, but we wanted to be cooler than we are. <laughs> but we're really nice. No, we're we're smooth. Can we get a little bit of the lyrics from no. "If You're Gone"? No, you can. Could go you ahead. imagine that that was about? I mean, that's him meeting his wife, but like it's not thinking me. that they could be it's, together because of his son. I can't. It's and they've too been much. together. I didn't for how know, many years? I didn't know that three AM was about his mom dying. That's like I didn't know. She only sleeps when it's raining, oh, and she screams, it's, it's and her voice is straining. She's, oh, oh that's, that's a tough <laughs> one. We've just depressed ourselves. Well, we hope you've enjoyed this episode. We need a little uplift. Come on, don't leave us like that. Also, that, that he sang the demo, and that, like, and Santana was like, can this kid, like, is he really a guy? Like, sounds can we pretty get, good. Can we get the guy from the demo? Yes, the guy from the demo is Rob Thomas. That's like a number two Billboard song. Like, it's said... I heard that song so many times. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> it's just like the ocean under the moon. It's the same as the emotion that I get from you. <laughs> She's not looking this up. Give me your heart, make it real. <laughs> or just forget about it, Jonathan. <laughs> from our breakdown to the one we hope you never have. These are all just from her head. She's we'll see you next not time. even <laughs> looking them up. It's Maya Bialik's Breakdown. She's gonna break it down for you. She's got a neuroscience PhD or two. One fiction, one 
something now she's gonna break down 